Hello. When I sat down to parse post-humanism and what an incredibly grand claim that is, I was thinking specifically about what the new materialism is and how it's changed my research. For me, the set of philosophical comp uh, concepts mobilised in archaeology under the label of the new materiality revolves around the networks of Bruno Latour, an assemblage theory mobilised in the vibrant materialism of Jane Bennett. So in that sense, I'm speaking very much to the themes that Rachel has just so adeptly summarised. There are clearly many other philosophers and theorists whose work feeds into the same rhizome come saiety, but I found myself most often thinking about Bennett or Latour. As a starting point for parsing the contribution the, of these theorists to my thoughts, I propose oversimplifying their body of thought to the following propositions. In the new materiality, everything is an assemblage, or hoseity, or gathering, or thing, at every scale. In the new materiality, actions emerge out of relations, and intention is not directly correlated with agency. I'll briefly take these propositions in turn, providing examples from Latour and Bennett, before articulating, trying to articulate, how they've led me to producing a post-humanist understanding of Byzantine song. The first proposition that I think is common to the new materialism is that everything is essentially an assemblage at every scale. An articulation of this theory which I found helpful is the concept of the black box. The term black boxing, or black box, is one that's commonly used in the sociology of science and is a concept that I've come to through Latour's work on actor network theory, particularly Pandora's Hope. In his discussion of networks, Latour holds that the world is relational at every scale, from social networks and economics to the micro and even quantum levels. We're, we are able to understand these assemblages as entities because we group assemblages together and we define them as things. This process of ignoring the interactions that make up a thing and only paying attention to its output or emergent property is what is meant by black boxing. The key point to keep in mind here is that black boxes can be opened and reorganised. They're not fixed or essential, but eternally reconfiguring. If anything within the network which makes up the black box changes, the black box itself is different. I've found that thinking in terms of black boxes has encouraged me to recognise that my presupposed units of analysis are not necessarily the most useful, and that, that I might be better off working at a larger or smaller scale. And particularly that's showing up in my, um, in my field work right now in thinking about periodisation and how we create these taxonomies and black boxes of periods and move between them and shake them up. And actually you end up with a very different analysis if you decide not to look at, say, late antiquity, but the Roman period and the Byzantine period, or, you know, moving those things around has been very helpful for me. As a side note. The second proposition, that actions emerge out of relations, can be illustrated clearly through Latour's discussion of the National Rifle Association. A, like, much overused example, but I'm going to use it again. <laughs> um, Latour characterises the two sides of this debate as moralist and materialist. For the NRA, whose unofficial slogan is guns don't kill people, people kill people, the state of a person is essentially either moral or amoral, and the presence of a gun does nothing to change them. From this perspective, the natural state of a killer is to kill whether or not she has a weapon. Contrasting with this position, Latour characterises the materialists, slogan, guns kill people, as holding the position that people are transformed by the materials in their possession. From this perspective, it is a truth universally acknowledged that an angry person in possession of a gun must be transformed into a killer. For the new materialist Bruno Latour, it's neither the moral slash amoral intention of the human, nor the potential of a gun to fire that kills a person. Instead, it's the network of human, gun, everything else that combine to produce the emergent property of a network, someone who's been shot. The third proposition, that intention is unrelated to agency, or is not directly correlated to agency, um, is an extension of the idea that actions emerge out of relations, and is the part of the new materialism where the post-humanist character of analysis emerges most clearly for me, decentering human agency. The clearest example, to my mind, is Jane Bennett's discussion of power grids. Again, a really overused example, <coughs> I'm just going to go through it again. Um, so Bennett's discussion of power grids in her book, Vibrant Matter. Bennett de details an assemblage made up of electricity, power lines, financially motivated decisions, the economy, a storm, a fire, a flood, or the weather world, to borrow from Ingold, and lays out how the specific combination of all of these assemblages produce the emergent property of a massive blackout in the northeast United States. Now, you might be thinking that wouldn't have happened without humans, and you would be right. The humans are part of that network. But it also wouldn't have happened if the electricity had behaved differently or if there hadn't been a storm. 
the quote-unquote result of the dispersed agency of the assemblage, which is the blackout, was affected by human intentions, but we can hardly say that it was caused by it. The intentional actions of the humans were only one aspect of the action of the grid. With those three propositions in mind, I want to shift now to talking about how these central ideas affect my archaeological work. This paper grew out of an undergraduate seminar that I was teaching last year at Brown, which juxtaposed the new materialism with an overview of Byzantine theology, politics, art and architecture. It was my dream course to teach, and like I live for teaching it again. Um, the particular theoretical impetus grew out of reading Bennett's Vibrant Matter, but also Victor Bukley's Archaeology of the Immaterial, which acts as a counterpoint to much of the new materialism by explicitly addressing the immaterial. Helpfully for my work, Bukley specifically thinks about the immaterial in a Byzantine context. I'm a Byzantinist. The image on the screen is a section of Glenn Brown's The Death of the Virgin. In many ways, this image is an icon of the assumption, and it's also the cover of Bukley's book. A central issue I have with Bennett's work, and with much of the new materialism, is its secularism. And I think that this might work well for post-enlightenment societies. I don't know, I don't study post-enlightenment societies. It might work well for prehistoric societies, but it really does disservice to Byzantium, which is entirely within a Christian worldview. Part of my particular parsing post-humanism, then, is to ask where a Byzantine god fits in the new materialism. And I think that the answer is as an actant in a network, as an assemblage along with other assemblages. Within the paradigm of the new materialism, metaphysical questions of whether or not God has intention or agency in a traditional sense are largely by the by. The question instead is how God the assemblage contributes to emergent properties of acts of worship as one black box among many. I would also challenge the idea that the Byzantine God is fully immaterial. So much of Byzantine art, <coughs> visual culture and theological life is about presencing the absent. And the heart of early Christian theology is a vast and far-reaching debate over the material nature of God, visible in narratives of the transubstantiation of, um, of communion. Aside from metaphysical issues, is the material impact God has on Byzantine selves. From ascetics to taxation, God is part of very material networks in Byzantine contexts. I'm going to move now even further away from parsing post-humanism in the abstract to trying to work through how post-humanist analysis has impacted my study of Byzantine song. And bear with me while we go a little further into theology. Within early Christianity, it makes very little sense to separate psalmody, that is the singing of religious chants, from liturgy. They're very closely enmeshed from the beginning of practice. In the fourth century, the song tradition moved from only being present in the monastic sphere or only being documented in the monastic sphere to urban churches. Within the song office of early Byzantine worship, every audible segment of a service was sung, and that's still largely true for very traditional Orthodox, um, Greek Orthodox services today. Different segments of the liturgy are sung by different groups within the church. There was a very strict hierarchy set out in, um, in text of soloists, cantors, and choirs who maintained different sections of worship. At points in the song office, the entire community was expected to respond with short, memorable song phrases, and it's an aspect of this call and response that I particularly want to focus on. And I'll play you a short excerpt, excerpt from Contikikon from the Nativity, very appropriate for this time of year, sung by Capella Romana. Now, the Contakikon, um, composed in the 6th century, became a fundamental element of the song office. This recording is based on a 10th century diastematic text which gives you the tune so you can see it. So it's not exactly what would have been present in the fourth century, but it reflects the aspects of the earlier Byzantine song tradition that I want to highlight. You'll hear one monophonic chant, one melodic line, passed back between the professional choir, the salty, and the congregation with a drone maintained by the ison, or like five drone singers. The piece starts with a soloist, and then the professional choir, the salty, who would have been professional singers within a church context, pick up the theme. That's then echoed by the congregation. Here you'll hear the difference because the congregation are uh, played by female voices for contrast, I think, as a, as a stylistic choice of the, of the choir singing, the, creating the arrangement. In the, sixth, in the fourth to sixth century, this would have been mixed. Um, okay, let's listen to some Byzantine music.
So we can imagine that that's probably more messy in a fourth century context. This is a very <laughs> professional recording of this particular. But, but you can hear the things that, that matter for this analysis. You can hear that there's a melody sung by a choir and then it's echoed and it's a repeated it's a repeated phrase that if you're embedded within that musical tradition would be very easily learned. It's call and response. It's built to be sung communally. And it's, a, it's fundamentally an oral tradition in the fourth century. So there are any number of black boxes which went together to shape the experienced nature of song worship. I'm going to try and unpack just three of them quite quickly and look at the potential experience of the congregation as an emergent property of that network. Early Byzantine churches have particular acoustic properties. Mr. Repentiva's work on the Icons of Sound project attempts to reconstruct the acoustic space of Hagia Sophia to discuss the auditory experience of the sung rite. And her works really produced an appreciation of the depth of echo created by marble spaces and the placements of different groups contributing to the sung office. People are placed at different places, uh, like different points in the church. Um, there's all sorts of architectural tricks that are employed by the Byzantines to make these voices seem like they're coming down from the central space. They're coming down from the icon of Christ or a uh, fresco of angels quite often. The dislocated nature of sound produced in Byzantine churches was entirely deliberate. And it's this that I want to take as the emergent property of church architecture and song moving forward to the next assemblage. Churches were designed with these clever manipulations of acoustic space and concealed choirs to build a soundscape which was uncanny and mysterious. This sense of mystery cites the unknowable nature of God on earth, which is a running trope throughout Byzantine text, art and architecture. Visual examples are common, but I, I particularly like this one. Uh, this shows Gabriel, again, very appropriate for this time of year, and you'll see that his wings don't quite fit in the frame. Gabriel's wings don't fit in the frame because they are too large to be contained by earthly means. This is like a running trope within um, Byzantine texts, within art, within architecture, that God is unknowable and too large to be within a certain sphere. Sacred spaces prefigured um, the beyond, the other world through their visual and auditory emergent properties and church buildings are really set up as paradise on earth. The second black box I wish to unpack is the process of learning and communicating early Byzantine music. The early Byzantine tradition of music is essentially an oral one. Even after the development of idiostomatic recording, melodies must be transferred from practitioner to practitioner to maintain the knowledge of psalmody. The earliest musical texts just give you rhythm and phrasing. They don't actually give you a uh, pitch at all. So you have these very specific local traditions of how things sound. Um, and all of the recordings that, um, that people are making currently are interpretations of either diastomatic or adiastomatic uh, notation. So melodies must be transferred from practitioner to practitioner to maintain the knowledge of psalmody embedded in the community. And this produces a congregation singing a rite which is a known constant. Sung responses are acquired, not prompted or scripted, a significantly different experience to the majority of modern musical religious practice. The passing on of oral traditions of song creates a specific type of knowledge born of familiarity among the initiated and requires a certain simplicity of the rites to be completed successfully. Not everyone can sing. Part of repeated known context is a sense of belonging, which I want to take forward as an emergent property. The last black box I want to mention involves a point of theology which I won't dwell on, the relationship between church and self in Byzantium. Early Byzantine ideas of eschatology, and Gavin Lucas very kindly introduced that concept for me at the start of this conference. Usually I have to define eschatology, but I feel like I don't have to. It just means relating to the other world. What happens to the self after death in a Byzantine context? So early Byzantine, um, early Byzantine ideas of eschatology revolve around becoming one with the body of Christ, becoming one with God. It's also important to note here that in early Christianity, church is not a space, it's envisioned as community. Um, and that's sort of a very central concept of, um, it's the, the body of Christ and church are really held together as, as one and the same. So what does a post-humanist archeology span of Byzantine song do? For me, it results in analysis of experience. And in this sense, it's not so different from some branches of phenomenology with one central difference, that it decenters the human in the analysis. If we're talking about the importance or perhaps the power of actants within the overall assemblage, the acoustic space and arrangement of singers created echoes which are much more important to the emergent property of experience than any one voice. 
The dislocation of the sound from its source, along with a Byzantine understanding of the importance of, of presencing the absent, citing the immaterial, produces God in church space. The effect of communal chanting of monophonic lines of song and the dislocation of echoes produced by the architecture allows any one single voice to be, become lost within the overall sound. And I don't know if anyone's um, been part of kind of one of these big singing spaces. Um, the, the thing that seems most familiar to me is a tradition of carols in Sheffield where we all go to a pub and sing incredibly loudly. But it made me think of this last night singing Bohemian Rhapsody with everybody at the tag party. <laughs> well, like part of a community, part of this shared practice. The effect of communal chanting of monophonic lines of song and the dislocation of echoes produced by the architecture, it, it does allow it to become dislocated. So I think that the assemblage of the song office may have created embodied experiences which cited the eschatological understanding of paradise as becoming one with the body of Christ. I'm not, I'm not saying that this prefigures the textual, um, the textual kind of codification of theological ideas of eschatology, but I think it's parallel to it. I think it's part of the same lived tradition, but for a, a not necessarily literate community. Let's return to the three propositions that I put forward as characterizing post-humanism and see how they work with analysis of Byzantine song. So everything is an assemblage at every scale. For a Byzantine context, I think this absolutely includes God. Actions emerge out of relations. The emergent property of the embodied theological experience of congregations becoming subsumed within the community of the church would not work the same way in other assemblages. It's the combination of musical style, lack of um, notation which tells you about pitch, acoustic properties, and knowledge of God which produces the potential for this particular interaction. Although a number of the concepts, spaces, and musical traditions extend both before and after the early Byzantine period, I think it's only really between the 4th and the 8th century that this particular theological understanding of this emergent property is likely. Intention is not directly correlated with agency. This is closely related to the previous point, but it bears repeating. No one designed the interactions I've described, no one person. We are already within the world, and so are the Byzantines. This isn't necessarily experiences intention effect. In conclusion, a new materialist archaeology encourages us to acknowledge that we are black boxing assemblages for our own analytical ends. Those boxes are open to reconfiguration, and we should be challenging what makes up our assemblages at every scale. For me, this opens up analytical possibilities that have been left closed by a discipline very firmly tied to text, but which studies communities who largely couldn't read. Thinking about the particular experiences of groups of laity, I think, is a useful mobilisation of post-humanist thought. The flip side of that is that I don't think the new materialism has so far done a very good job of placing the numinous in its, in its networks, but it can do. God might work in mysterious ways, but the Byzantines are deeply concerned with materialising him, here through the embodied allegory of song. Thank you. <laughs>